repeat myself again to give you some time. Uh, the picture froze. We had to re restart the um, restart the live, which was annoying. Um, so we talked about Rumi's background. We said um, that he has very unique and very helpful ideas about about uh, about suffering. Um, just to repeat, just to recap what we discussed, um, when we say pain, we mean generally, generally, we mean something physical. I have a backache, I have a toothache. Uh, it works as an alarm to help me to go to the dentist, to go to the doctor. So this pain is helpful and philosophically easy to defend. Why is there pain in the world? We said there is another kind of, if I could call it pain, or what we call suffering and uh, something that includes physical but goes beyond the physical pain here in suffering we when we say when somebody is suffering we generally mean psychological mental spiritual things that are more difficult to deal and heal um deal with and heal um so we said that uh, I'm just repeating myself for others to join um, from the other meeting. Um, so we said there is the Quranic argument saying that uh, we test you with these trials or to, to test your faith with the trials, with the difficulties and challenges and pain and suffering in your life. But um, more than that, today we're going to be discussing other items. One of the important points that is uh, quite common in, uh, in Christianity and Islam is the uh, soul purification argument, where we say that sufferings and painful instances in your life serve a purpose. They build your character, they, they help you morally, and they purify your soul, your heart. Uh, and this is, like I said, quite common in both Christianity and in, in, in Islam. For those from a Christian background, I would suggest uh, John Hick. He has famous soul-making theodicy soul making argument what happens is that if you could look at it from, from a particular human instance we could say well in our personal personal lives we have all experienced this but when we have difficulties in life when we face challenges we build our character or we become more resilient uh, more well-built and stronger people um, and this is true spiritually. So spiritually, when we go through under difficulties in relation to what is happening in our lives, our, our, our souls are getting purified. Our hearts are getting purified. In the same way that we, when we go through difficulties in life, that those difficulties, those challenges make you a stronger person so much that we have all these expressions in different languages like what doesn't kill you make you stronger in english for example the same happens spiritually we go through a fire a painful process uh, we go through suffering and, and and through that we are cleansed spiritually our hearts are cleansed so that we can receive the divine light so that we can receive the divine grace um, because for divine grace to appear in your heart, you need to cleanse that heart. You need to cleanse that mirror so that it can reflect the divine manifestations. So look at this way, suffering and its instances lead to self-awareness and overcoming of ego. We discussed this in our previous session, just to give you a recap for those who were not in the meeting. Um, what happens is this, humans are in a perfection journey. They are, they are journeying from the human animal self, from the animal life to the divine, divine self. And there are different stages. So what, what's gonna happen is that first you need to separate yourself from the animal life, animal desires, this obsession with the sensual life. Like I wanna eat everything I want. I wanna do everything I can. Um, indulging myself with, uh, with, 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 with sensual desires, with uh, excessive sensual desires. And uh, so our animal selves is, um, are pushing us towards, towards all these comfortable situations. Uh, by separating ourselves from this, lowering this, moderating this, not eradicating them completely, but moderating these, these, these um, 
pleasures, let's call them, uh, we are getting closer and closer to our higher selves, our spiritual self. Um, so it's a transition from our animal self to our spiritual self. And there are certain things that help us in this journey to make the transition easier, faster, more comfortable, and increase the quality. One of the most important things in this journey, in this transitioning process, is suffering. Quran says specifically, and we have the traces of this again in Christianity as well, it is explicitly said that, well, sufferings help you here. Suffering, sufferings help you in your transition from your uh, animal to your spiritual selves. So ego must be tamed. When you say ego, I don't mean it in a Freudian sense. I mean it in, uh, in, in our, like, in a sense of our lower self. Consider yourself having different instances, in different stages, different levels. For those who are familiar with Plotinus, for example, this makes the conversation easier. Plotinus says you have different levels of self. The, your, the shadow of your real self is in this world, in material world. Your real self is uh, with the divine and in the divine. Comes down to your intellect, uh, the, your self in the intellect. So uh, then comes down to yourself in the soul and lower, lower, lower until your shadow self, your, your uh, physical self. Now, what's, what's happening is that uh, in transitioning from each stage to the higher, uh, higher one, uh, you need certain things. And like we said, one of them, the most, one of the most important ones, one of the most helpful ones is suffering. So you need to tame your ego. You need to tame your lower self to be able to detach itself from all these desires, extra things, and, and, and concentrate on higher things. Interestingly, um, Plotinus here does, has this very interesting example. He says, when you think of yourself, think of it this way. Think of it, think that you are in a river. Your feet are in the water. The rest of your body is outside. Now, in the simile, what is happening is that the part of body, your feet that are in the water are your material physical self. The ones that are, the, the rest of your body is your spiritual self, your real self. You're not aware of it. You're only conscious of, 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 of this watery part, if I may, the part that is in the water. And it is only, you're gonna be aware of, of your real self, of your higher selves. Um, when you detach yourself from the physical, um, not in an excessive sense, but in the sense that you concentrate more on the spiritual, spiritual realms, you, you, you engage yourself more with the spiritual self. And little by little, uh, you're going to be understanding, I'm understanding in quotation, understanding those, self, those, those selves and those levels better. For example, Plotinus says, and Rumi would agree with this, um, in order for you to know something, there should be the, a duality, the duality of knower and the known. I know that there is a camera in front of me. There is a knower and there is an object that is known. So what things in the spiritual world are, they work different. Knowledge and thus knowing works different in the spiritual realm. It doesn't work with the duality of knower and known because there is no distinction in the spiritual realms. You know things, again in quotation, by uniting, by becoming one with your with the object, with the uh, object of your knowledge. So um, coming back to Plotinus' example, you don't realize the spiritual realms because you cannot understand them with this consciousness. For that, you need to transcend this normal, physical, sensual consciousness and um, appeal to a kind of unity. And that comes with the spiritual practices, spiritual process. And what helps in this process Guess what? Suffering. Suffering helps that transition a lot. Now, for those who are new in this, in this talk, um, I don't want this to be a talk. I want this to be a dialogue, a discussion. If you have any questions, by all means, please type it in. Um, I will be reading them occasionally, answering your questions. Don't wait till the end. Now, one of the instances that uh, Rumi refers to all these difficulties is uh, in his famous poem um, where he says, Pas Riyazatra Bejonsho Mushtari. 
He says this, this asceticism, the difficulties, the hardships, the suffering you're experiencing are so helpful uh, that you don't need just tolerate them. You didn't need to invite them to your life. They are that helpful. He sees behind the curtain. He sees beyond the curtain. He sees the result explained to us theoretically. He says, look, something big is happening when, when, when you go through suffering. Um, this process is a different one. This process is much, much easier. So accept it. Embrace it in your journey. Now, um, another uh, this is like uh, in, in more theoretical. Uh, for we, what I explained so far is more theoretical, but there is another one that we have all uh, another perspective towards suffering that we have all experienced in our lives. When we uh, we just start an example in our human lives, uh, there is this girl, there is this boy. The boy wants to prove to the girl that he loves her. Um, well, what does he do? He's gonna for sure do things to show, look, I can do things for you that others cannot. I can get through difficult situations for you. I want to make you happy. I, I, I will push myself into difficulty, uh, maybe even go so far as to accept pain just to make her happy, just to make her more comfortable. And um, the, looking at the matter from this perspective, Rumi is doing the same as actually in mysticism, Islamic, Christianity and others. The, the, the lover as the human being is in love with the beloved, the divine beloved. And this game is the game of trying to prove yourself to God, putting yourself and going through difficulties just so that, look, I'm happy with what you give me. It doesn't matter whether it's bitter or if it is, if it is sweet. I'm not afraid of going through difficulties. If you're my beloved, I'm gonna put everything on the table in this gamble. So he's Rumi in this instance, is playing a gamble. He has this famous poem. He says, As to the antiretis, was de l'ojan sad raison. He says, look, cut me or hit me with, with, with sword, with knife. No worries. My heart is satisfied with this. If you want if you're gonna put me under difficulties, no worries at all, I'm happy with this. In another instance, he says, He says, acclaimed is the gambler who has lost everything. He has left nothing, he's left with nothing but one thing, the desire to gamble again. Now, in, in other instances, in other instances of his poetry, Rumi is saying that gambling with money is a childish game. The real gamble is putting your existence on the table, your entire existence, and, and, and gambling with God, gambling in quotation. It says, look, all the things, all the beautiful things you have given me, all this beautiful life that is distracting me, I don't want any of it. I'm gonna let go of all these pleasures and so far as to go. I do away with my engendered engendered existence just to reach you and even in this process even if you go to put me under difficult difficulties no worries i'm happy with that uh, in the continuation as of, of this poem i'm not going to bore you with the uh, with all the farsi texts um he, he says if you take the sword I, against me, trying to hit me, trying to frighten me, notice that I'm not gonna even move. I'm gonna stay, stand still. You cannot scare me with this. If this is your way of putting me into uh, trials, fine. I'm happy with everything you gave me. So let's recap this last stage. In this stage, the lover is playing a game with the beloved. No matter what difficulties the beloved gives, the lover is saying, I'm happy with this. You have given this to me. You, it's you who have put me under this difficulty. I am happy with that. Um, in, in, in a poem, I don't remember the Farsi. This is a beautiful poem. He says, um, if somebody comes to me and says, look, look what your God has done to you. Uh, look how much hardships you have gone through. Look how much pain and suffering he's throwing at you. I would smile and say, yes, these are difficult. These are 
bad, these are bitter, but they are from my beloved. So whatever it is, it is sweet for me. In, in, in an example in Mathnavi, I think, um, he narrates this story, a famous story, a different version, a famous story of um, Lady of Majnun, uh, the iconic lovers in Persian mystical poetry. Majnun is the guy, uh, Leili is, is, is his beloved, this famous girl, let's say. And uh, she, she was having this, let's say, ceremony, giving away food. And uh, everybody was standing there with some, um, with, with some, let's say, plate in their hands. And he comes out, he sees that Majnun is in the line. She gets furious because she has rejected Majnun several times, comes closer, takes, his, takes Majnun's uh, plate, just smashes it, destroys it, gets angry and returns. Everybody starts blaming um, Majnun, saying that, look, you have spent all your life after this girl and look how she's treating you. She doesn't love you at all. And Majnun smiles and says, well, if he wanted to be with somebody else, out of all these people who are in this line, why did he break my plate? Things are not as they appear in their appearance. Things are not as they appear. If she wasn't into me, why, why did she come to me? Why did she chose me to break the plate of? Why not you? Why not the other person? So um, you're deliberately embracing the difficulty to prove yourself to your divine, prove yourself to the divine beloved. Now, there's gonna, there's gonna be another category, another perspective we can look at suffering from Rumi's perspective, uh, which he calls actual suffering. And it could be, we could translate this as allegorical suffering. It's not an accurate translation. Just bear with me, please. But before I start explaining this, does anybody have any questions? If so, please do not wait until the end of the session, write it down. I will be happy to answer the questions while we are working together. I want this to be a dialogue. Now, um, a distinction Rumi makes between two kinds of suffering. He says, there is real suffering and there is allegorical suffering. Real suffering he calls the primary suffering he calls the separation from the divine beloved. We were in union with the divine. We were one with the divine. We were part of the divine. And then we were separated in creation. And those who are not aware spiritually, those who are not aware of, of, of this situation, they are quite uncomfortable. They do not know what to do. They do not know how to go back to their divine. But let me just rephrase that. Those who are not aware spiritually, they don't need, they don't feel the need to go back to the divine. They are engaged with the superficial life, with the excessive sensual desires. But those who have like uncovered uh, the veils that separate them uh, from, from the spiritual truth, the spiritual realities, suffer in the sense that they are separated from their source. They do not belong to this world. They are from another higher, more valuable, higher in being, higher in reality, higher in value realms. And uh, they are stuck here like a bird stuck in a cage. They are not happy this, with this. They want to transcend and go back to their fatherland as Plotinus likes to call. So Rumi calls this kind of suffering the real suffering. He says, if you have one single suffering in this world, that's your separation from your divine beloved. The rest is just misunderstandings and allegorical sufferings. For example, he says, the neglecting of your self-awareness leads to further hardships. Sometimes you bring uh, difficulties onto yourself. Not all difficulties are on, 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 on God. Um, for Rumi, the second category that is allegorical suffering, um, there are divine challenges that elevate the soul, according to Rumi. There are certain difficulties really given by God, and, and you experience them. They are painful, they are heavy. But um, what is happening is that, like we discussed earlier, they are helping elevate your soul in the sense of building your character, purifying your heart, purifying your soul, getting you closer and closer to your divine to the divine beloved. So Rumi calls these graces in disguise. He says, on appearance, you look at them, you see them in suffering. But behind that 
guys, there is divine grace. He has this beautiful poem in Mathnawi. He says, Qahra az lutf danat har kasi, khah dana khah nadan ya khasi, lik lutfi, lik lutfi ya qahr, lik lutfi ya qahr dar penhan shode, ya ki qahri dar dil lutf aamade. Baqiyan zin do gumani mi parand, suriya lane khud be yek par mi parand. Um, if I am to translate this poem, it, it goes this way. Rumi says, well, whether you're a wise person or a fool, you know that there is divine grace and divine wrath. You know that there are both of these. But not many people know that sometimes they, 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 they wear guise. Sometimes God deliberately deliberately disguises grace as wrath and wrath or misfortune as, as, as grace. Why does he do this? Why not just show grace as grace, wrath and misfortune and hardship as the sufferings they bring? Uh, Rumi says here is kind of a, this is my term, here it's kind of a trial. God disguises the suffering as grace or grace as suffering at instances to help distinguish people who are looking at the matter superficially from those who are looking at the matter um, with a sharp eye, Spirit those who are spiritually sharp. So those who are spiritually aware, the keen people should be going through trials. It's not a ready given gifted thing, like all oh, every, every knowledge you want God will give you, see, this This is your suffering, but that is not just a suffering, it's, it's a grace. You need to go through trials to understand those those, those things, though, that knowledge is going to be disclosed to you with difficulty, not with, with, with ease. So just to recap, in this sense, sometimes those sufferings appear as grace and grace as suffering. And Rumi says something interesting in Mathnavi. He says... Um, one of the things that uh, you're experiencing in life and you find something that you experience in life and you th think of it as suffering and you're um, blaming God for it, that in fact is not suffering for somebody else. To put it simply, suffering and difficulty and negativity, positivity could be, not in all cases, could be relative. What is sweet to you could be painful to somebody else and vice versa. And you shouldn't be um, fooled uh, by appearances and be careful to see behind the disguises, um, behind the masks. Be careful not to see whatever you see in the surface. And this is particularly the poem uh, showing this relativity. He says, Hast baron as pe parvardegi, has baron as pe pajmordegi. He says, The same rain that nurtures the plants, the trees, flowers. Um, the same rain in the wrong time could destroy the same plants and flowers and trees. It says when the spring, the rain comes, it has this life-giving effect, but the same, the same rain in the autumn is destructive to the same garden. Um, the same thing, different times, different appearances. We look at it, so oh, this is a grace, but not so much, according to Rumi, according to Pyrrhus. On Bahari knows Parvar Daskonat, Bin Khazani no Hosho Zar Daskonat, Hamjanin Sarmovo Bado of Tob, Bartafo Wotono, Sarvesh de Biob. The spring one is nurturing everything. The other one is destroying everything. Think of this about other things as well. Think of this formula about cold, about wind, about the sun, and ponder the differences. Ponder the differences to understand that things are not that as they always appear. Not that there are no sufferings, yes, there are sufferings, as we've been discussing. God specifically says that I, I have put sufferings into your life to test you, but not all of them are really suffering and some of them are um, relative, according to Rumi. So just to recap, uh, the suffering is not always an obstacle. It's a necessary force that shapes the soul. Enduring challenges and pain leads to spiritual resilience and deeper awareness. 
and it brings profound understanding of existence leading to divine grace. Now, before I move on to the next section, does anybody have any questions? If so, please type it. Uh, let's discuss them. Another perspective uh, we see in Rumi's works is the matter of death. He says death is not the end. It's a transitional thing. Uh, it's a transition from worldly to spiritual um, um, stages of your life. And in this transition, there are certain things helping you with this, um, helping you with this change. And one of the things that help you a lot is suffering. Suffering help you transfer from the physical to the spiritual more conveniently. Suffering, when seen through this lens, becomes instrumental in aligning the soul with eternal spiritual truth. Um, so just to recap the whole thing, uh, we could say, I'm going to be reading this entire sentence, please bear with me. Rumi encourages the faithful not to endure, but embrace life's adversities as necessary for spiritual development and enlightenment. First, he's trying to show us that first, yes, there are sufferings, but no, sometimes those sufferings are just misinterpretations. It's subjective. But taking them all together, no matter what it is that you're experiencing, no matter the pain uh, you have experienced, they help you spiritually, physically, in, in the worldly life, they might be difficult, and they are difficult, but that, that is exactly the pain, the difficulty that is nurturing you, helping you in your spiritual journey. So if you're thinking a higher realm, a higher knowledge, spiritual reality, spiritual truth, you need to go through sufferings, and you need to be not just endure, but embrace them, invite them into your life. They're going to help you greatly. Now, um, I don't want to go further than this because, like I said, it's going to be a video series with several videos coming after. Uh, I'm going to be stopping here and see if you have any questions. Um, and while you're thinking about your questions, last session I promised you that I'm going to show you the rest of the books that you were so fan of and asking. Um, some of Rumi's books I have brought. So. I don't think I can turn off the camera momentarily. So I'm just, um, this is the famous book written could be a very difficult word, but uh, written by Sam Stabrizi because in this book, there are certain parts that we see. Let me put it this way. Sam Stabrizi uh, was having these discourses, his lectures, and sometimes it was him. Maybe he was writing. Sometimes it is appears from the book that there were other people writing what he is saying and so not always himself writing it is a great book for those of course who read persian i think there are english translations it's called the magalot in farsi and in english it's called discourses some stabrizis discourses i'm gonna read this very interesting uh part just to summarize it to you page 44 it says this is Shams Tabrizi himself speaking. Shams says, Rumi came to me, the book is in Farsi, like I said. Um, Shams says, Rumi came to me with need, not with dispute. If you came to me, if you, Rumi, came to me with trying to like debate, try to have a heated debate with me to prove myself or the spiritual realms to you, I would sit there so quietly, not uttering a word, for several days, listening to you. I would listen so much that you get tired and you let go of me. But you didn't do that. You came in with need. You said, you, I, I need you. I need to know more. I need to know higher realms. And that's a fascinating passage. And I, I have, I'm sure we have seen this in our lives. Uh, when we, so there are certain people, even if they have very high knowledge, they ask something to you and they ask as a child, like, what is this? I don't, I don't know, can you help me? And uh, they, they absorb the information, but there are other people, 
even those who do not know anything about the subject matter, they ask you a question, you start answering, and the moment you open your mouth in the first few words, they cut you, say, no, 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 it's like this. And Sham says, well, if you came to me like that, I wouldn't have accepted you. And there is a message here for us that we need to be showing our need uh, when it comes to learning more. So great book, if you can read Farsi or you can fight the English, go for it. Fihe ma fihe, these courses of Rumi himself. Uh, there are like short stories, short talks, these courses that Rumi talks about. Sometimes I have talked about this in my videos and my papers. Now, there is this comprehensive commentary um, of Mathnavi. Rumi's famous Mathnavi has this commentary. I think this one is like 20 volume by Karim Zamani. Um, again, in Farsi, amazing commentary, a contemporary commentator. Very good book if you can read Farsi. Again, Karim Zamani has um, interpreted uh, Divan Shams of Habrizi. So far, uh, two volumes have come. Um, the commentary of Divan Shams from Karim Zamani. So far, two volumes. Uh, the rest are on the way, as far as I know. This is the other volume. Now, there is this old book, a couple of books actually, there are a couple, called uh, the, book of, the Book of Rumi, Molavi uh, Name in Farsi from Jalaleddin Homayi. This is an amazing book. So, what, what the author is doing, he's a great Rumi scholar. What he's doing is he's categorizing the information from like Rumi's teachings into different categorized themes. Uh, if you want to read Rumi's perspective with regards to, I don't know, knowledge, gathers you the information, gives you a taste of that. So amazing book, two volumes, again, if you read Farsi. Coming to Turkish sources, uh, there is this book from uh, Ekrem Demirli, um, a Sufi scholar in Turkey. Uh, he has this famous book called Shair Sufiler, like um, the Sufi poets. This is in Turkish, not in English. And I don't think it has an English translation, but it's a good book. It, talks about Rumi, it talks about Yunus Emre and Niyazi Misri. I think this book was first written in Arabic, uh, Erfane Molavi, that is the mysticism of Molavi, from Dr. Khalifa Abdul Karim. This is the Persian translation, but I think it was written in English. The author is very sharp. He has very keen um, insights uh, in the book. If you read Arabic or Farsi, go for it. Now, another book by Allama Muhammad uh, Taqi Jafari, where is Mike, what makes Jalaluddin Rumi's Molevi, what makes Jalaluddin Rumi's words so fascinating? Why is, why is he so attractive after so many centuries? He's examining this matter. He has a very sharp um, perspective towards Rumi in general. He's a very sharp guy in general. I've read several of his books. It's amazingly, amazingly sharp. Now, another book, another um, compilation of some ghazals from Divan Shams Tabrizi is this book, Ghazaliyat um, Shams Tabrizi, Muhammad Azza Shafi'i Katkani, which is a contemporary scholar, a very uh, knowledgeable person um, in Iran. The other ones I said all were in Iran, except for Khalifa Abdul Karim and Ekrem Demirli. So these are some of the books I promised you uh, in our last meeting to show. Last session, we didn't, I didn't show you about Rumi, more I showed you other books about Sufism in general. But um, I, I made a promise, I kept it. I hope um, this, this talk helped you. We're going to continue these talks every week. Just to give you some variety, next week I'm not going to be talking about worldly um, hardships, not about suffering. I'm going to give you another topic um, to make the conversations a little bit more exciting. We will come back to sufferings in the later weeks. Not to mention, uh, we're going, we are hosting, um, we're actually doing a roomy reading group uh, on Sundays. We have decided about the days. Um, 
write a comment, I will give you the information. We gather together with people from several countries, read Rumi's work, prepare before, come to class, a video call, um, discuss different ideas and uh, different perspectives about Rumi. Um, our first lesson is, our first meeting is gonna be tomorrow, Sunday. And if you wanna know more, just text me on Instagram or comment this video after I publish it. Uh, I'll give you more information. Thank you very much for um, staying until the end of this video. It was a pleasure, pleasure talking to you and looking forward to our uh, future talks starting from next week. May God bless you. If you do not have any questions, we can end the meeting here. It appears that there is no question. Yes. May God bless you. See you next week.